Coming in here to see Dennis Friel today, some of his great artwork, and I guess he's featured in this magazine. And Jesus Christ, Dennis. What kind of picture is oh, no, that? No, 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 that's the wrong one. That's the wrong one. This is the right one. Oh. That's, oh, okay. This one's, this okay. one's Not mine. Not so revealing? This one's mine. Not so revealing. All right, good. Good, good. Much better. Fish, boats. <laughs> Sap, and we're honored to have, um, can I say it, the best fisherman <laughs> in all of South Florida. I love saying I'll, that about you. you know what I mean? It may I'll or may not be true. I know you always you get real humble yeah. about it, but yeah, you know, not if you're not it, the but, best, then I'll be hard-pressed to find another one. There's, there's some really, really great ones out there. You know what's funny about it is, you know, there's so many different styles of, of a fisherman, and and some of them would never compete. And, and early on, I would Tournaments, Jamie Bunn. I moved in across the street from his parents' house. Mm -hmm. They're blue water movements and uh, tournaments. No, I'm not going to fish tournaments, man. I don't measure myself up against that. But I was coming out of a semi-commercial fishing background, and and then that said, as a kid, my dad and one of his buddies from down there, Carl's Bait and Tackle, uh, Billy Curtis, who was the second owner, he, he they tournament fished, and I was with them as a kid, and mo mostly the dead bait stuff up there, mm -hmm. meat fish, dead bait stuff in the summertime up there around Fort Pierce. And I loved it as a kid, but I, you know, it wasn't tournament fishing to me. It was that's what they were doing, and I was yeah. just there, and and I fell out of it. And you know, it, what I'm going to with here is that you know, the, there are so many commercial fishermen that manage to make a living catching fish and selling fish, right. and a good living. Those guys that are successful at that level entirely can pay their entire mortgage and keep their family afloat. Those are the great fishermen. Yeah, the competitive fishing thing. To win at consistently, cons consistently, you're obviously a very good fisherman. But you know, it, and it, it, now it's how I make my living entirely. But for, I, I separate those two, and and we're doing it for fun, even though it is how we make a living when you're doing it competitively. But but it, it's it's different to me. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, we have um. There's a saying, you know, Yarmir Yager for some reason is making a lot of noise. <laughs> I can hear his. I, I move around a lot. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> That's uh, move around a lot. So, I mean, there's, we always say, we always quote, one of my favorite artists of all time is Chuck Close. And we always quote him on this show. And he's, he's got that saying that say, says, um, inspirations for amateurs. The rest of us wake up early every morning, get to the studio and we get to work. Grind. Baby. Meaning, yeah, grind. Exactly. Yeah. Meaning that, you know, I'm a professional artist. If I sat around floofy, floofy, waiting for inspiration every day my family would not eat, yep. you know what I mean? And Absolutely. it's the same thing with those guys you're talking about, that yep. the, the everyday fishermen, that they have to catch fish and make their customers happy to keep food on the table. And, you know, you don't have a choice, man. If the, the bite's off, you still got to be out there. You got to still gotta try hard. You got to find a way. Yep. yep. And that's and yeah, that's the same deal with the charter thing. And, and I've been doing it, and I dearly love it. I I love ta taking people fishing. I've had the good fortune of having only one less than positive customer over the last nine years of charter fishing. I think that's his problem. Uh, well, it, it, alcohol, excessive use oh, of alcohol with there a kid on the boat, yeah. and, and it just went sideways. But but otherwise, I, it's so fun showing people cool things and, and those days where they're not biting and you're doing anything you can just to show them something really cool, man, that's tough. I don't, I've don't. i never experienced stress like that. Not tournament fishing, not anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know what the financial means of the people that you've got on the boat really are, and, and I'm expensive. I mean, my boat's expensive. It, mm -hmm. I've got to be to to make a living. So you really want to make sure that they're getting their money's worth on it. And that stress is intense. You know, I think you know you have such um, call it a resume of success, um, especially on the tournament level, that I could see that about you because you're also a very humble individual. Um, and that's that's what we are. You know what I mean? And I think that's one of my favorite things about you is is you know, your attitude. Um, when it comes to this profession, um, you know, you have a very realistic approach about things and, um, you know, but I could see that in a tournament, you being more stressed out on a charter that isn't catching fish than you would be in a tournament because you have such a great success, re successful resume as a tournament fisherman that occasionally you're going to have to be like, well, you win some, you lose some. Right, God, I hate that. No, I, no, no, no. But, but seriously, <laughs> yes. in comparison to someone that's not catching fish on a charter, like, man, I really want them to catch a fish. You're going to be thinking about that other person more than yourself, you know? And, yeah. But yeah. I don't know. I know you're very competitive. So yeah, don't, don't, take the, the don't take what yeah. I said the wrong way. No, 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 you know no, no, I mean? no, 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 no. But bombing in a tournament is devastating. And it, 
and and it's become bombing in a tournament fifth place or worse is absolute failure and devastating but but it has become such a drive because it's harder to do the work when i was younger had a, having a, a business outside of fishing and and i mean you'd go 24 hours between doing your daytime job which was early and late and tough back then to bait fishing all night long and go right back into the job the next day mm-hmm. I, it shocked me how well I could go for four days with maybe an hour or two crashed on the side of the road here and there yeah. you know, during the day. You didn't sleep at night. Can't do it anymore. 45 is different. Oh, my God. Yeah. But but you do poorly in a tournament, and it stokes that fire again, and I don't care what it takes. You're going to put forth the effort. And a big portion of it is putting forth the effort. It doesn't matter the cost, be it financial or sweat equity. Uh-huh. It takes a great deal of effort. And, and many of the consistent tournament fishermen, they've got the skill set, but their work ethic is second to none. Yeah. And and that's... That's everything. Yeah. That really is. It is. I mean, you know, is. I always compare, because it's just my, my best way of understanding all this or making sense of it all, is I always compare, you know, being an artist and being a fisherman is very similar because fishing is an art. We've mm-hmm. said this on the show, you know, many times before. Absolutely. And work ethic has a lot to do with art. It really does because you can be the most talented individual in the world, but if you're not willing to roll up your sleeves and put in the time, it ain't going to be worth. If you're not a producing nickel. art, you're not right. getting exactly. Anything. <laughs> if you're not producing, you're not producing. You know, yeah. and you know, oftentimes, you know, there have been, you know, in my younger years, all nighters, and you know, you just yeah. you do what I, you know, whatever it takes at all costs to get it done and make it look as best. And some, you know, that does get a little harder as you get a little older. <laughs> but there are times when you have these wins. That you experience like a high beyond belief. You're like, yeah, that's why I do it. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the nice thing about the darkness, it's quiet. You can absolutely get a lot accomplished and a lot of thought. Yep. In the dark when nobody's trying to get in your head. And the, you know, much of that, especially after a, a poor performance where I will go goggle eye fishing and you run each scenario through your head. These are the and it's all decisions. And these are the decisions where I went wrong. Er, er, tournament success. The work and everything is extremely important, like I said earlier. But then during the day, it's all decision based. Mm-hmm. When I first in two thousand one, when I first got talked into tournament fishing, thank you, Jamie Bunn. It I knew I was a very successful fisherman prior to that. When we go fishing, we catch fish. That's just what we do, and, yeah. and I loved it. And then I fished my first tournament, Lauderdale Billfish, and and uh, we had the bites and couldn't keep a hook in a fish. I'm like, what the? Mm-hmm. I, and, and I didn't understand that. And then we went into that first summer year season and we, we got a second place in one of hit Jamie's tournaments and we won a ladies, but then we were terrible in others. And even I pretty sure we got disqualified in the first rodeo we ever fished for bait fishing prior to lines in. And I can't remember the guy's name, lightning Leo. I do remember his lightning name. Lightning Leo. Lightning Leo. He sees us catching speedos at the can before lines in. Well, they're not a student of tournament fishing at that point. There was a rule in there, no bait fishing before lines in. And the guy's yelling over the radio, hey, native son, you're disqualified for the day. You're bait fishing. What, the, what is this guy mm-hmm. talking to? Fuck you. Yeah. I'm not disqualified. Well, Lightning Leo was right. Now, he's an ass. Don't get me wrong. I have zero good feelings towards that guy. Usually guys that will call you in like that without talking yeah, to you first. Call hour. me on the phone and say, hey. Yeah. Or just find somebody that knows me to call yeah, me. Give you a heads up. Yeah. Say, hey, you're not allowed to be doing that. Disqualify if you flick me. him off, then he can call you. In. Right. That's well, disqualify me, fine. Right. But but not publicly over the radio like that, for one. And, and my understanding is he was a talented charter fisherman back then, so I don't want to take anything away from his abilities there. His personality, he was an asshole. Is maybe, I don't know if he's still alive. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't hurt my feelings if he wasn't. <laughs> but... And he's, it was not, he's wasn't not just, connected by water. <laughs> it wasn't. It, it wasn't just that one experience. If you're wondering why I have such ill will, but that was one of the worst of them. So, at the, I think that was the moment where I realized, wait a minute, if I'm going to do this, I've got to become a student of this. Mm-hmm. World's worst student. I sucked at school, but I pick a tournament, a date, anything. I pretty well have memorized what has happened, almost from 19. 19- 98 through now in any of the local events. Mm-hmm. And I've studied it to the point where I'm pretty sure I know where they were when they won the tournament, or I know for a fact where I was, what the conditions were like. And 
You have like a photographic memory when it comes that, to stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We were sitting talking to a dude the other day. He was talking about the, the what do you call it, a 98-pound Wahoo that rebound caught in, uh, to win that KDW. Mm-hmm. Time out, Cap. Oh, it was at the fuel dock the other day. Uh-uh. Fish weighed 72 pounds. It was 2010. Right. And, and I mean, I ran the whole list, and it was a spectacular catch. They won 100 grand on that KDW. With good fortune, they weren't in quite a few of the other Calcuttas because we had four kings for not enough even to beat their KDW, but uh-huh. ended up in second place and won a pile of money in that event. But but it, it, to be successful at this game, what I'm trying to get to is you've got to become a student. You've got to put in the effort, work effort, and then study it. Know what it takes to win and get as much history on where and how and why anybody that was successful was successful. Mm-hmm. And it's so much more than just fishing for sure no no doubt about it i mean there's an there's an author called um, malcolm gladwell i'm not sure if you're familiar tipping point if you ever heard of that book i do know the book yes he talks about this thing called the theory of ten thousand hours yeah where you you uh, you to be is you got to put in your ten thousand hours at least you know they talk about the beatles doing it and why the beatles became so successful and steve jobs and like all these people Mm. well it's like Natural when talent plus natural talent plus the ten thousand hours. You gotta yeah. put in the time, man. There's there's no way other way to get around it. And there's gotta be scenarios where you're in a tournament, going, I've seen this before. I felt this before. This oh, is what's I, about to dude, happen. I just got the chills from yeah. so many memories of that exact yeah. moment. And that moment, you're you don't have a fish in the box. You haven't released a sailfish. And oh wait a minute, winds here, yep. conditions here, barometric pressure here. Watch this, guys. We're fixing to go win. Yeah. yeah. Two hours later, rums poured back then. How many times? I mean, there. how many times? I mean, you're what, just watching a leaderboard and you I don't. see. No, 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 not you. No. I'm just, uh, actually now I'm talking to the crowd. How many uh, times you watch a leaderboard? You see, boom, oh, Native Sun. It's not like on, on the last day. Oh, Native Sun's moving up. You know, and that doesn't happen by mistake. No, no, a condition, a condition changes, something occurs. Yeah, you're recognizing it all and adapting right. to it. I mean, real time. Well, that's, that's the decision making right there. Yeah. The, the, it's, and I tell the guys throughout the course of the day, guys, we are one decision away from winning this tournament. One good decision, keep pushing. And, and they'll, they're obviously that you go through droughts. There's times where you start to lose your crew and you can feel that energy drop. And, and it's, it's important. Don't talk down to them. You hear you know, the adage, the old, the captain yelling at the crew. Yeah. And I'm like, God, man, that doesn't work. If you're yelling, rule number one, if you're yelling, you're losing. You're doing it wrong. Yep. It's got to be positive. Positive energy, positive thought. But recognize when maybe their minds are drifting. We all got a little bit of that ADD. Mm-hmm. It's hard to stay focused. You know, the sun gets hot. Oh, you know, yeah. You're not catching any fish. I mean, it's yep. tough to stay standing. Recognize when that's occurring and make sure they know, look, guys, I hadn't made that decision yet, but that only means that it's coming later. Be mm-hmm. ready. And and in so many events, especially in the meat events, where it only takes an hour, an mm-hmm. hour of the right condition and the right bites, and, it, and you capitalizing, and you won. I can't tell you how many events. Changes everything. Yeah. It, most of them occurred early in the day. First hour of the tournament, it's over. Might as well go tie to the dock. We just won this thing, guaranteed. Mm-hmm. But on several, and they were my by far my most enjoyable and exciting and favorite events, were there's – Less than an hour left in the event, and a condition changes, and all right, it's about to happen, boys. When we make a move, done. Yeah. An hour later, one event. And one of them, a uh, Palm Beach event, I remember so vividly. I, everybody's got their moods, and my boy Jason back then and, and buddy Brandon were so bad to go in the tank. If we weren't competing and, and looking like we were going to win in the first half of the day, I'd lose those guys. Really? I, and I know one of them medicates himself now to get out of that funk. <laughs> Prescription by with with help from a doctor, not sure, and, yeah, and uh, not a, not from a freelance pharmaceutical. Right? No, none of right. that sort of thing that I know <laughs> of anyway. And uh, they, you know, I thought I'd lost them for sure, but then they finally, after that event in Palm Beach, in the last hour, made a move and smoked it. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was there were forty pound kings laying over the all over the deck and sharks all over the place and mahis. It was unbelievable, and, and to watch those guys go from that funk they were in to. Jesus, I, I cannot give up on this guy anymore because it might be the last five minutes we're going to yeah. win this thing. Yeah. And that recognition of, of seeing your guys reach that level of, of belief uh-huh. is is as good as winning any event. Yeah. I mean, the three, I think we say 
again, parallel between art and fishing. The three C's of design are consistency, consistency, consistency. It's the same for fishing. Yep. The three yep. C's of fishing are consistency, consistency, consistency. Yeah. Uh, a good friend of mine, as we all want to know, uh, Bernard Paulus, yep. fishes with you. And he always says, he's like, you know, one of my favorite things about art is he just doesn't lose his cool. No. Like, no. ever. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and he goes, that that is that goes a long way on a boat, yeah. you know, when, when you're managing and when you're up there in the tower and... You know, you got guys looking at you for answers, and you just don't lose your cool. You, you won't know? believe where I learned that. Where? And, and I I see it now in the greatest NFL head coach that ever existed. But in powder puff football, my junior year of high school, I was one of the coaches. And we were doing extremely well, and I fired up sprinting down the sideline and jumping up and down. And my old man, who was a football coach and and – Tons of experience there said, man, you look like an idiot. He says, dude, you have absolutely lost it at that point. You're not recognizing what's happening. You're not ke- getting all the information you possibly can because you're out there celebrating. Mm-hmm. Uh-uh. When the, when the party's over, that's when the right guys, that's when you celebrate. When the game is done, now you celebrate. You have no more thought that, that has to go into this. You don't have to learn anything more. Right. So junior in high school, oh, it makes sense. I got that. Well, Powder puff football. Yep. 16 years old. Yeah. 17 years old. How old I was. That was a moment where I changed and, and, and was able to start seeing things when that everybody else is celebrating and I'm, and I'm recognizing the changes are, are, are making, are creating the ability to make decisions to be successful mm-hmm. when, yeah, we won this battle, but we got a lot of the war left to fight. Yeah. While the clock's ticking, you're still working. That's exactly. the way. I, that's the way I kind of look at it. You know, no, I'm still on the clock. I'm still working. I need to stay focused. You know, absolutely. That, that, I look at things like that in the same way. Um, it's kind of nice that you had your dad there to, you know, oh, dude. give you that tip. But Tough I'm guy. sure that wasn't the only one he's given you over the years. No. I mean, being seventh generation native Floridian, thus the native son. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure you're a big influence of your time in the water. It's because yeah. your dad. Absolutely, and he's he's everything to me. I and mean, really, he was he was an extraordinarily strict father, which probably kept me healthy and safe mm-hmm. as a young man. I, though I think I was pretty tame. But uh, it, it, interesting thing, it, you know, the, the generations. He did all the genealogy, and I haven't bothered to look that closely into it yet. I'm sure I will as I get older. But uh, well, his he's father, five now. So. Yeah, <laughs> his father was fish man, and. And their relationship wasn't great, but there, I'm got to believe there was somewhat of a bond there. He spent a lot more time as a young man in the woods. Mm-hmm. My dad did, but my father was a fish man. He was a fisherman. He always supplied all the fish. He worked in a packing house in Citrus up in Vero Beach there. And and I, I loved, he had that look of that old salt fisherman. He had that, that kind of squashed hat and mm-hmm. ragged and weathered. The back of his neck was so weathered from the sun. Man, did he scream a fisherman. I, I recognized it as a three-year-old. And I said, yep, that's that's me. Yeah, That's who I'm going to be. Mm-hmm. The weathered neck. And my old man's got that weathered neck now. And, and hopefully the sun doesn't beat us up to the point that it costs us too much. Yeah, you got to watch that, that these days I mean, with, with, with the, the sun. I how mean, is it different? What's that? Those guys survived it. Why yeah. am I not going to survive? Yeah, it? no, I mean, I think, you know what? I have a theory on, like, all the sicknesses and diseases that we have today, and I just think science is just so advanced in recognizing these things earlier. Yep. Then you, people, you just know, life, it. lifespans are longer now, yeah. and there's a reason, because they're recognizing these things earlier before that we had the same things going on. Yeah. It's just that people were dying from them because they weren't able to treat them, you yeah. know, so. I'm going to wear my skin cancer scars like a trophy, man. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you it's know, part of the lifestyle. Yeah, knock on wood, you know, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, it, it comes comes with the territory sometimes, you know. I mean, that's you know, when, when you're under the sun like that all the time. Um, so, I you, appreciate you mentioned the native son and the seven generations. That means a lot to to me and my people, and my family. I, I it's it's part of you. You know what I mean? It's a big yeah. part of you, and 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 it's important to bring it up. I think when you bring an art shop on the show called Connected by Water, because I want to get yeah. down to the root of who people are. Because yep. that's what this show is all about. You know what I mean? It's just about the community. It's not really a fishing show. You know, it's we a community talk, show. It's a community show. You know what I mean? But, you know, it happens that most of my friends are fishermen. You know what yep. I mean? But it's, you know, and that's what we end up talking about most of the time. You know, but it's really a community, community show about life, living life around the water and, yep. you know, and that aspect of it. So, 
Um, you know, we, we like to think we bring on the best of the best in this community on the show. We certainly have today. Um, so <laughs> one of the things is, you know, you are truly an ambassador, not only of brands, but you're just an ambas- ambassador of the community that, you know, we all, you know, live love. in, love <laughs> and live in and, and, and just, you know, are a part of. Um, and you're one of the chief ambassadors in that community. A lot of people look up to you with a lot of respect. Um, you are also you have no idea how hard that is to hear it. No, I appreciate it. It's, but, or it's mm-hmm. true. Come on. Um, so one of the things though, the, you know, even you are now a figurehead officially with this, what's this called? The South Florida this Management Fisheries Council? South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. So what's your role here? I am a council member representing Florida. Uh, it's an open seat. So the, the, the thought before me was a commercial fisherman out of, out of Fort Pierce, uh, Ben Hardig, an exceptional man, and spent, spent he, I mean, he's a commercial fisherman. He makes a living king fishing up there and has, has done so, I believe, his entire life. And he represented Florida commercial fishermen extraordinarily well. And when I got in there, I had some giant shoes to fill, and I'm, I've had to, to reach out to commercial fisheries that I really have never had my hands in at all to make sure that I'm able to cover their basis. But what I've recognized is there wasn't really anybody covering the charter commercial fishery from Broward County South that well. And, and to try to study up and, and fortunately from the relationships I've developed over the years, have been able to sit there. I'm sitting there at these council meetings and I mean, they set the rules within the, I got to say, within the restrictions that the science community gives us, which is a disaster. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Absolute disaster. But that's what our, our, our task is, to set the rules that within the, the, the regulations that the science community gives us. And you've got to do it for an area from Key West to the north end of North Carolina. North Carolina. That's the region you're that's responsible region. for? It's utterly ridiculous. What? Dennis, it is ridiculous. That's it's, way too long. Wait, it's... It, it, there aren't even a rem- the, the, it needs the, to cut the, off at, at they're not even Canaveral. in the same biosphere no not at all Canaveral South has to be it should be its own region and then Canaveral North North Carolina because the amount of fishermen for one from Completely Canaveral South ecosystem ten times of fishermen from Canaveral South and there are you know be actually using the ocean day to day basis trips being made but we all have to work together on it and. Georgia and South Carolina are almost negligible, in my opinion. Right. Not enough people go. They can't do enough damage, in my opinion, to— The coastline is completely—I right. mean, alone. Is just, as long, yeah, yeah, exactly. As, if, as long as they have reasonable regulations, Georgia, Georgia and South Carolina are going to be just fine. Right. North Carolina has got a, a, a strong fishery. There's a lot of people fishing out of North Carolina, and, and the fishery is extraordinary. I mean, they—that they, 60 fish mahi limit— yeah, and they, the charter boats when the mahi's around, they wreck it. Every one of them, they hit that sixty, and they're not successful unless they do. Yeah, that's got to change. Yeah, it's got to change. Yeah, and and that's something we're working on right now. We're I, I is most of that out of the Oregon Inlet. A lot of it is, but it's Hatteras. It's all through there. Yeah, they, all up, yeah. They, they're and there's some great fishermen up there. I mean, they they do some some amazing stuff. But that 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 theory or that thought process of we're not successful unless we hit our limit on our yellowfin tunas, not successful unless we hit our limit on the mahis. The, I mean, when they go to wrecking the blue line tiles, they, they got to hit their limit. And there's some differences in the way that they do their limits up there than we do. Their captain and crew count as as anglers on the boat. No, so really? They, oh, yeah. So they count, too. Other than with the mahis, they stop at 60. They're going to devastate that fishery if they keep that up. That's the thing. The blue line tiles are fine, but the science community, it's such a rare event species on their on their the, the way they do their science that when one is presented and one is encountered with their— Dockside checks. Uh-huh. One fish turns into a million, and they feel like oh, they're being overfished all of a sudden. Yeah, the species is fine. Now, it's got to be balance for sure. Yeah. You know what I mean. But like reasonable regulation, reasonable on the regulation. Yeah. Biggest key to success in the future in in fisheries management, recreational reporting. It has to. We have to find a way because right now the science community, in my opinion, is using algorithms that are so advanced that. Normal human being, you, the, you guys can't understand. That's what we were told in our last meeting. I think the science community does that a lot. They do. Purpose, they talk down. Design, oh, just, it, just to confuse people. This scientist was even saying they're so advanced, I can't even understand them. Right. But this is how we're going to regulate you. Oh, well, it sounds like, sounds fancy. Uh, yeah, we got to believe it. Dude, the, the, yeah. he almost lost the entire room at that point. Even the rest of the science community. Dude, you're going to talk down to us at that level? Yeah. 
it, it was it was it's aggravating. And, 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 and he said that right after I informed him that in 2007, 2008, at the, at the lowest of the economy, when fuel prices were above $5 a gallon and I'd have the ocean to myself, basically, it was amazing. It was a great time for me because somehow I was able to con- continue fishing, but there was nobody out there. We had it all to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yet that was the height of the trips on their, their, whatever, their graph that they were showing us. There were more people fishing in 2007, 2008, and there are today by their reports. There's no way that's possible. Not at all. No. And they were talking millions and millions of trips and even shore-based trips, which you would think would be more likely. Well, the Georgia constituents were saying, you basically have the entire state of Georgia making a shore-bound trip a day for like 100 days of the, of the year. So the entire state of Georgia doesn't go fishing. And a lot of them are out to the west. They're not making it to the ocean to go fishing. It's right, just right. so much bullshit involved in the in the science of what we're trying to do there. And that's who limits us. And then what's what's bad is now the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, they get the blame for reduced limits on species that there should absolutely not be reduced limits. And like the whole red snapper fiasco. Well, didn't the um, DeSantis just expanded that? The other well, day. it's on the Gulf Coast, not on the Atlantic Coast. Oh, that's on the Gulf yes. Coast only. Yeah, DeSantis is a godsend, dude. I, he's amazing. I, I really, I, I really, I, he's yeah. going to be president one day. I, I said the same thing. Yeah. I, I hope so. I, I really, and hopefully, he doesn't get swayed by the time he gets there. I think it'll be all right. Yeah, he's got the pen. He's got, yeah. he's got the. Uh, I you thought know, we it, were going to go into politics, but I love you that. know. No, you know that's okay. <laughs> I can talk. I talk about DeSantis a lot because I really yeah. like the guy a lot. You um, both. On on this love show him. because he's a big advocate for clean yep. water, which yep. is like our really big cause here. So I do bring him up a lot yep. because that was really his first act as governor was like yep. this fi- is what we're fire do. that that tire the, the Everglades. Um, yeah. You know, council, management council you know, the management right. council, and and yep. you know, let's let's put in new blood in there, people, yep. because those, all those guys were a on the on the take. Yep. So so I hear. That's right. so I hear. Yep. Right. Allegedly. Allegedly. On the, and, and just, oh. you know, they all have their own personal agendas. Water management counts. You, counts. Yeah. And, and then so he, he said the first thing we do, need to do is just rip that apart and start over. Absolutely. Which was the smartest thing. Absolutely. Because we we're seeing the, the the effects of it today. Absolutely. Um, there's still some so fun jewel thing, the stuff that we need to take care of. But, you know, you one know. of the guys on my boat is married to a fun jewel who separated from the family years and years ago. They're not wealthy, unfortunately. Or he'd be helping us support this, <laughs> but uh, it's it's funny how the connection can be made though. But, hey, Mikey Gulla. Yeah, I, I think um, what I, I mean. I guess we're getting off on a tangent with that yeah. right now, but you know, I, I definitely think you know I, we talk about that a lot on this show, and uh, um, I definitely think that there's some land that should be granted to the state to at least let the water flow south. Yeah, I hope in our lifetime we get to see a moderately natural flow. Yeah. Um, Flip, did you re- read the thing that Flip Pallet wrote yesterday? Or you know, I saw it. I've been pushing. It's not that long. It's a really yeah. good read. Actually, I could probably bring it up while my phone's not in the room. Um, but it's a really good read. Uh, it's very short, and it'll probably take you about five minutes to read it. But it's really kind of like a punch in the face to, hey, guys, if no one's going to say it, I'm going to say this is what's actually happening. It's just, and it's very simple, yeah. you know, as to, you know, he's like, this is... When I was a kid growing up, he grew up in Southwest Dade on the edge of the Everglades. He would fish down a flamingo all the time. And just the amount of deer and otter and just yep. all different kinds of species, you know, and even the, the pythons and everything like that. And because the, re- the reason that he brought it up is because people are like, oh, we have a python problem. He's like, yeah, well, now we do. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's because all the other species are just, you know, the entire place is yep. gone. Like rookeries, you know, by, you know, the yep. old herons and stuff are being abandoned and... Is it ever going to come back? Yeah. Well, I think it, it can come back if we treat it yeah. properly, you know, and then that's why I fight the battle here. Absolutely. You know, because I yeah. think it's, it's, it's possible to salvage it. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. That, there's, there's so, the problem is there's so many avenues that need to be tackled. The plastic in the ocean is a giant one today. Yeah. And it's, how, has it, how has it exploded over the last five years the way it has? I mean, is that much more plastic being used in the world? I mean, we, I've been reusing plastic bags since I was five years old. I mean, it, how is it all of a sudden that it's all in the ocean, all over the place? You see it constantly now. Yeah. And yeah. the balloons, dude, aside from my helium balloons. Well, the mylar. The, I mean. The mylar balloons, they, yeah. dude, we, they got to go. They have to go away. Yep. They have to go away. There's just, it doesn't even take a west wind anymore. You see them out there on two weeks east wind and there's mylar balloons floating in the ocean. How is that even possible? Where yeah. are they coming from? It's crazy. I yeah. mean, it, you know, I think really, you know, if 
to, we teeter on the edge here of extreme environmentalism and just common sense. Like, yeah. you know, let's all just be responsible. Can't yeah. we all just no get extreme. that through our heads yeah. and, and just, you know, not throw your trash out your window? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is runoff. Um, and even a lot of people, you live on the intercoastal, you're in, in the yeah. intercoastal community. And there's, I'm sure there's people just hosing stuff off their back. Yard, like right organic materials, I'm okay with. When I say that, I don't mean fertilizer and stuff like. That. I mean, if leaves and some tree limbs end up in the ocean, oh no, no, that's different. Yeah, but yeah. The plastic garbage bags and some they, they blow so easily too, and it seems like we've had so much wind here this this fall. Mm -hmm. But blown trash getting in the canals, and thank God for four oceans and and these groups four that, oceans is an out, you know four oceans and an outstanding organization they're actually coming in to be one of the sponsors for the pompano beach um lighthouse point holiday boat parade oh, as nice. well yeah so tell me was, get off the sharks though u.s yeah. shark populations are fine get they're off fine. that please they're fine they're they're, 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 if they're anything, more than actually, fine they're more they're than thriving fine. yeah way too strong yeah they're, they're, they're i've never seen so many sharks in the intercoastal over the last year I even made a video of a dead manatee where there was in dark water. You oh, can yeah, see I remember that. Time. A giant hammerhead shark coming out from under Hillsborough Inlet Bridge headed out to the ocean. They've been cruising around. I mean, when I say giant, this thing was seven, 800 pounds. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it, the shark population is extraordinary. And unfortunately, on the South Atlantic Management Council there, sharks aren't our purview. They're a highly migratory species. So there's mm -hmm. a whole other council that handles the, the billfish and the sharks and the tunas. And <laughs> they have little to no belief that there are even any sharks in our ocean to speak of. They, they want to protect it. Yeah. They think it's all like Japan, you know, shark fin soup and, yeah. you know, and all that whole yeah. thing. And and I think we've slipped by, there was a, a, a bill trying to get past to where shark fins were going to become illegal entirely in the U S that happens. There's no commercial shark fishery that will ever exist again because the value isn't there in the meat. Mm -hmm. You can make a, you can break even on the meat in the sharks, but you make your money on the shark fins. And if you took the fins away, then nobody would go shark fishing ever again commercially. And I, God, the populations are so strong now, I would hate to see if there was zero commercial fishery on them. It would yeah. It take forever to balance. And I believe it will balance over time. I mean, I believe it'll balance over time. And it's only, it's, only a matter of, you know, one thing you got to watch out for if just something like that happens is eventually those sharks are going to start creeping in more inshore and more inshore and more towards closer well, to the beach. All, more I, yeah. I mean, it's going to get even worse, yeah. like, over time. And yeah, these are primarily coastal starts, migratory fish. Yeah, these when are, it starts affecting yeah. your swimmers and your tourists and stuff like that, then they're going to be like, wait a minute, this it is a bottom line issue now. They'll see them, it'll scare them, but it won't affect them. These are fish-eating sharks. They seldom want to bite No doubt about it, but that's what I'm saying. If they start yeah. seeing them, then people are going to yeah. be scared to go in the water. It's going to affect a lot of things. I don't know. That, that, that Perhaps that's just a theory on my behalf. No, no. I mean, if they're seeing them, and we have the good fortune of having good clean water on the in the ocean frequently, you can see. We do. And and but it's crazy. You see these videos where people are swimming, and there's a shark ten feet from them. They're clueless. Yeah, they, they have no idea. Right. None. <laughs> clueless. Yeah. This twelve foot tiger shark swimming yep. right through them. Yep. <laughs> clueless. Yeah, it happens all the time. All the time. Every day. Yep. Every yep. day. Yeah. The uh, how do you feel about the um, the new blackfin rule? Love it. I, I wish there was a size limit on them, though. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and so I was actually involved in that. Take the footballs away? Yeah. yeah. Well, reasonable. I was I was at 18 inches of where I wanted to be. I heard a lot of 15 inches. And, and I was speaking with FWC quite a bit about that. And the nice thing, FWC started this, and it's going to now, I'm going to introduce it to the at the federal level at the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council because, you know, it's a fishery that, that is targeted up through the entire mm -hmm. uh, management area. And and the North Carolinians are are they generally catch nicer black fins up there. They don't catch too many of the small ones and but they don't throw anything back. They don't somehow North Carolina doesn't have a size limit on Mahi, where the entire rest of the region does. Now mm -hmm. I'm not a big proponent of a size limit on Mahi. I hate seeing minnows killed, but they're such ravenous feeders and they get the hook so deep so frequently. If you hook the Mahi, you bring it in a boat, it counts as your limit. Keep it ninety yeah. percent of the time because it's going to die. Mm -hmm. Release mortality on a mahi is is horrific. Uh, the bigger ones, but who's releasing the bigger mahi? They yeah, no one, yeah, no one, yeah, no one's letting that go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, uh, I'll see you later, yeah. fifty pound bull. It ain't happening. <laughs> uh, although Jose used day. to do it somehow. Jose it's only in fight. South America. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. They're a no, they're a nuisance for bill fishermen yeah. down there, and even in the Bahamas, a bill fishermen they run from those green hornets. But that's a t that's such a small group of fishermen that that do that. But uh, so I don't know. I, I, they reproduce so quickly, so too. They do. But yeah. at the same time, we have to caution because 
dolphin fishing is not as strong as it was no. even five years ago and 15 years ago. So, yes, we are having some effect, when I say we human beings, mm-hmm. on the mahi population. I don't believe that it's so much U.S. recreational or even commercial for that matter because the commercial sector only gets 5% of the fishery, mm-hmm. mahi fishery. So don't get on commercial fishermen about how many dolphin they're killing because they're killing 5% of the fishery where – the recreational sector has that other 95%. They've never, prior to these new numbers coming out, they've never gone over like 60% of the catch. Mm-hmm. But even at that, you're 60% to the commercials 5%. I don't want to hear about recreational fishermen dogging commercial fishermen on mahis. That, that's ludicrous. They're, they're allowable catch is so well, limited. That's our common fish around here. I mean, it really is. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's our most prevalent you know, species. And, and how many times you go to the, oh, what's your fish of the day? Oh, it's mahi. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's scary is how little of that comes from this country. Mo- the majority of it is imported. Really? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I was unaware of that. Yeah. Our, our, I don't have the number. I should have probably brought the numbers. But the amount of mahi that is eaten in this country far supersedes the amount that is legally commercially harvested from mm-hmm. this country. So. It has to. We have no other way of keeping up with with the demands mm-hmm. other than to import, which there were a few agendas that I was pushing were fully licensed, fully commercial licensed charter fishermen. I was pushing hard to try to allow them to sell any mahi catch that they had that was beyond what the charter wanted, mm-hmm. as long as they were fully licensed commercial, just like a commercial fisherman would be. And infrequently, if you caught... If you were to take 60, which I would never take 60 mahis on a charter, you're going to end up with a ton left over. It's a lot of fly in the day, first of all. Dude, I generally stop at 10. Yeah. Guys, 10 decent mahis. And the the guests, they don't realize how much meat that actually is. They bring this little cooler, and they expect to fill up the boat, and they're like, oh, I filleted two fish. I can't fit anymore in this cooler. Pretty much, yeah, what do you guys can keep the rest? Well, guys, so I'll I'll frequently 10 fish. All right, let's go do something else. Always something else to do. That's always the great thing about South Florida. Yeah. There's always something to pull on of some kind, even if it's just a barracuda. And I'm going to start having to bring cra- crabs on the boat, calico crabs or something. I've been seeing permit out front of Hillsborough Inlet on every inbound tide coming home. Yeah, Couple you're getting really them? big ones. I haven't, I haven't had crabs or anything. I'm, I'm, I'm running in. Oh my God, here's another one. Let's go permit fishing. I'll do it on a calm day. I guarantee you we can. Call me up, dude. I'll go do that with you. Cobia anytime. style, cruise the beach and yeah. j- between here and Jap Rock, and you're yep. going to see them on the beach. It's more than I've ever seen in, in years past. We used to see them herring fishing down around Government Cut all the time. Right. Frequently early in the fall and then again in the spring, but starting to see them up here, which is in big ones. These fish are not small. That's nice. Yeah. It'd be cool if we did develop a fishery along those lines. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, maybe there's some, maybe some more uh, prevalent wreck situations and yep. stuff like that might, might help that out. And two, we spent quite a bit of time this summer kind of cruising the beach before the lifeguards got there, casting on snook. Mm-hmm. It was it was a fun thing. The dolphin fishing was so bad this summer yeah. that we were hunting other things to do, and we'd do that until the wind came up enough we'd get the kites up. Uh, and, dude, that was fun. And then in doing that, you get to see some of the other species that you didn't know were in there all these years. And Yeah. And unfortunately, still not seeing the beach cobias like we used to. But Well, John, John did a pretty okay I mean, uh, on the last mullet run there. Walking yeah, the beach, ended, fishing. He's, he's ended kind of kind of early right this this year, but yeah, that's my yeah. thing is wind, surf dude. fishing. Yeah, so much wind this year. Yeah, put yeah, it was it was rough. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Oh, Both I was them. hoping that we get a another late push there after they're, things kind of died down. There's yeah. there's some around, yeah. but I haven't really heard many big fish on them. It's oh, there's okay, a lot gotcha, of schools. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah the bait's here right now. Again. Yeah, the, we've got a really good push of finger mullet rolling through right yeah. now. Yeah, or it's probably. We're all getting geared up for tournament season here, too, now. So, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. seeing some bait in the water isn't a bad thing. No, it's wonderful. And I get my all my pins, are, I'm starting to load them down good, and, and the stuff starts to grow all over them. And when the mullet are around, it reduces the growth. Yeah. Um, yeah, they sit there, and they chow on that thing all yeah. day, all yeah, all day long. you back there in the mullet working on the bait pins. Now, in a couple of weeks, when they start to disappear, oh, yeah. <laughs> the growth. Get the cleaning. So yep. I want to, in, in light of, let's segue into that for a second, into the yep. tournament stuff, right? So I want to, um, I guess we can officially announce that Please. Art Sap, um, Captain Art Sap, I will officially call him, <laughs> will be coming on the Connected by Water on a monthly basis for what we haven't officially titled anything yet, but it's basically going to be the Connected by Water tournament report with Art Sap, and we're going to 
throughout. Well, we're going to probably do that all the way up. We could do that as every much month. As you want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can do that every month because there's always something going on around here in Florida. That's the beauty Absolutely. of where we live is there's always action. Yep. Um, you know, maybe, right. maybe October or September might start getting a little slow, but, you know, we can still do something with that. Absolutely. And we could talk about, talk about traveling tournaments and different things that you do too. Certainly. Um, so for those of you that have become fans of the show, yay. First of all, thank you. <laughs> um, we're going to be doing that once a month. I think that's going to be a really good thing. That's going to be the fun, fun well, my, The way I see it too is, listen, it's, it's a community thing. If we can maybe talk some of the guys, the other guys that we're competing against to, to get involved a little bit too, and, you know, bounce some theories and thoughts and why. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I yeah. guess we should say that we're going to be bringing on other yeah. people too. If and, they're willing. And, to. Yeah. If they're willing to come and sit with us and hang out and talk about the tournaments and people that yeah. have success and people that can just be knowledgeable and yeah. offer some good insight into that realm. And yeah, it's going to be a fun thing. Yeah. I want to have fun with that. Absolutely. You know, I don't want it to be just like there's a report. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, and, and time the, the, one of the main reasons I want to do it is while, yes, I'm a little bit spooked of of releasing more of the thought process because I've released so much of the test, technical end of it through the seminars and everything. Well, you're 45 now. Yeah, so. yeah but, but <laughs> I need to create. I'm not let you forget you said that. <laughs> more and better ways to, to, to learn. And it, so much of my success has been from, well, this is, you know, I sit down and it might take a month post tournament and you will have fished into the tournament to be able to run through all the the occurrences and the and the decisions that were made and and why they were successful or unsuccessful. And I'm thinking this might kind of expediate it, I think is a word. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe. By bouncing some thoughts off of somebody. Because I've never really done that. I've never post tournament sat down and 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 run the thought process. And it's getting harder as I get older to to I'm not I don't Mem remember as well as I did in my twenties and thirties, but I can relate to that. Yeah, the sooner, the sooner I can run these ideas through, and if I can bounce them off of somebody, I think that it might advance it. And and I, I've had some success over the last few years. The last ten years have been successful, but prior to that, those were some really successful years. And I desperately want to have one more year where we string four or five together. Mm -hmm. in a row. And it might not be possible, He's, because not there are possible. so many. Well, there's a lot better when I say four there's a lot of wins. competition yeah. now. It, when it was then too, there were some some of the best fishermen in the world were fishing then too. But but so many more people have the technical skills that that I don't think is they, there were great fishermen in, but I don't think technically they were as advanced as a few of us were mm -hmm. in in our own particular ways. I, I, I immediately the rivalry Casey Hunt and I had, dude, that drove me to the best I've ever been because mm -hmm. that guy is extraordinarily good. And he was winning at a level that I couldn't allow to continue, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I saw a rivalry there. I saw a great human being there, and I saw a guy that I had to beat. Yep. And and that drove me for a few years there. And we had a couple of years where we put four or five wins together. Not successes, wins. Straight up win a tournament. Dude, winning a tournament's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of great fishermen that will never win a tournament. Not once. And still be thought of and should go into the IGFA Hall of Fame, which, by the way, I'm interested in. <laughs> I don't hear <laughs> We're gonna, We'll hashtag that one. Yeah. Hey, I don't know why. I, no, I think I, you should be there. I mean, you know, for, for you know. I don't. Uh, keep doing yeah. it. Keep keep on, keep doing yeah. what you're doing. You'll get yeah. there. No, yeah. I'm not worried about that. Yeah, but but anyway, I, I I don't have a direct rivalry right now with any one particular person. And and I'm wondering if that was part of the drive then. That uh, helps. I have such fond memories of the of that. that helps. I mean, with the Hunt family, I mean, can't say enough about Dude, them. I mean, the entire family. They're Pompano. Just, yeah, them, for sure. The Maddox. Uh, yep. I mean, it, Absolutely. The yep. Wheelers. Yep. Old, old Pompano. And I'm not. I'm from Lauderdale. I moved up here, and, and it was the best move I'd ever made because down there, when you caught fish, I didn't, dude, I don't have pictures of fish I caught as a kid for the most part. You, Nobody got to know about that. You want to know the funny thing is you bring that up. And I was on that show, um, Unfathomed, with George Gods, right? And yep. we did basically did a day of fishing right out here out of the inlet. And then they came in here for a day in the studio, and I did some drawing and stuff like that. It was a really great show. I don't know if you've seen the episode or not, right? We got to watch yep. it. It's really yep. cool. Um, but one of the things they asked me for was, oh, we're going to need some pictures of you fishing when you were a kid, right? I grew mm -hmm. up down here fishing, you know, whatever. Yep. And so I swear, I'm looking through shoe boxes, and I'm like over my parents' house. I'm like, 
what happened to all those Mahi pictures that we had? You know what I mean? And my mom's like, oh, they're probably somewhere now. So, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. that's the, the kind yeah. of thing. Now you just got to like look through your phone or look yeah. at your Facebook account yeah. and look at all these picture well, shots. But back, you know, uncovering those pictures, I was lucky enough to think you know, when I was 12 years old, holding some big bowls and stuff yeah. like that, we found a couple. Did but you, yeah, it was a lot harder. You didn't talk about it down there. No. It was, you didn't talk. You, I mean, it just, no, you didn't catch shit. What? Yeah. Why do you guys go all the time? You don't catch it. <laughs> yeah. You don't talk about it back then. And then I moved up here and there was this community where in the beginning it was guarded to some degree, but it was a community and you did kind of work off each other. And especially in bait fishing, you actually talked. You didn't. And if you didn't talk, dude, you were shunned hard. I was, it was so different to me. And I, that's one of the reasons I love having moved to Pompano area here is the the true community. Now, there's obviously the the rivalries and the ball busting and everything, which is a big part of it. But it's so much more a community than I ever felt like I was involved in down there, fishing community. Mm-hmm. And and it's grown now with social media and everything. It's it, it's one ginormous community. It seems like, but but it, it it was it was an interesting experience. Experience, and then to then get involved in the the tournaments and and that really really helped to to create that community and met so many wonderful human beings you know there was when when i was painting the bridge um now the bridge is just littered with fish right, right. this is fish all over the all different species and everything like that um and it was pretty much a done project and so and one of the new council members stepped in and were like well i i don't really i don't think we should move forward with this or whatever and we're like wait everyone was like wait what She's like, well, it doesn't represent all of Pompano and like all stuff like that. And we're like, time out. First of all, this is on the intercoastal. Second of all, this is Pompano. Yep. Like, th- this is what defines this community. I'm Not sorry if you don't see it that way, but it's the truth. Yep. Right. Yep. And it really does. And Pompano, Lighthouse Point, very unique um, in that respect of a town, yep. in that really the entire town just re- re- revolves around, you know, fishing and diving and, you know, surfing to some degree and paddle boarding, that whole aspect of it. More so than I think, and until you get down to the Keys, more so than any other you oh, know, town, town town along the coast. And that's really what makes it such a unique spot to me. I don't know if it's its proximity to the uniqueness of Hillsborough Inlet and obviously, you know, our... What an awesome inlet. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, 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 it really is amazing. I mean, you know, most of us are running north, you know what I mean? But still, it's just that whole proximity to where you don't really have to run north here. Sometimes the best fish you catch are right out front. Right out front. I can't tell you how many tournaments I've won right out front. Like, yeah, you know, less than three miles from the inlet, the billfish tournaments, to meat fish tournaments, to all of it, it, and and some of the catches. The, the bluefin tunas we're seeing roll through here now mm-hmm. in the in the winter time, sitting directly in front of Hillsborough Inlet in an edge when we got a good tailing condition and bluefin tunas rolling by, or the the humpback whale. I've got a video of a humpback whale jumping with the lighthouse in the background. It's, it's such an extraordinary. Oh yeah, oh yeah. we're gonna have to roll that one. It's it's a that's Facebook a Live video. We have is to get it out of my Facebook? No, thing. we'll be able to get it off Facebook Live. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, a hundred years ago, or live or posted on there. One of those, I don't know, but it, yeah, yeah un- unbelievable experience. And right whales we've seen in there, and like I said, talking about the sharks and and the permits, and it's such an, a special, special place. Skip was on. Um, Skip Dana was on um, not too long ago yeah, with, with yeah, Joey and so, Skip yeah. and, G- and we talked a little bit about. I don't know if you listened to that one, but if we talked yeah. a little bit about um, that little reef thing. That was yep. going on for a little while, which everyone was just kind of like rolled their eyes right right from the start. Like, this isn't happening. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, were you on that council? I was not. You were not. Not involved right. at all. No. I'm glad that went away quickly. Yeah. Um, oh, 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 you're talking about our Florida reefs. Oh, God, yes. No, I got called you, in late I on that. I thought you were on that council, right? Well, I got called in late on that deal, yes. That's what ended, made me end up where I am today with this fishery. Right. Painter, so. so this is completely complete overreach in in its finest regard They're trying in, again, in my way. mind are they trying again oh, so this is another right so this is another reason why i think it's important to keep bringing this up because they're going to keep trying oh yeah um yep. and i think it's important to stay vigilant on this because it's the fishermen it's the outdoorsmen it's mm. you know the concert are the true conservationists in in, in this yep. regard um the ones that really are keeping their house clean yeah. Um, it, the, the, you want to know the real quick? We're the, not the problem. Yeah, I'm no, sorry. The worst thing that has occurred from from all of this, and we have to now be conservationists. We can't be environmentalists because environmentalists are now extremists. Correct. They stole the word. Correct. And there was nothing ever. It was a, env- being an environmentalist had forever been a great thing. Now it's the same extraordinarily extreme. Just no. insanity is now an environmentalist, unfortunately. But it's true. When I was in high school, I started an environmental club. 
Yeah. Right. And it was for, for the mindset of what we're talking about today. Yep. But now that word has just been completely Stolen. silly puttied out into yeah. like something else. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy. But yeah, that, I'm, I'm petrified right now that we're going to lose a, a very good portion of 100, 120, 130 foot of water down in the ocean reef area to a, a federal issue that, you know, it's kind of between the, it'll be, it'll be a, a marine sanctuary, but they're talking about taking it away from the fishermen entirely. Key Largo? Oh, yeah. Really? Absolutely. Well, the park is going through some changes right now, and FWC is trying to, they're doing a great job trying to to hold the feds back because forever the feds have allowed FWC to control the park, the Biscayne National Park. And and they've had a mandate where you've got to heighten restrictions within the park for 10 years. All right, well, we're going to do some studies or whatever, and, and now we're kind of coming to the date where something's got to happen or the feds are going to take over. And you don't want the feds diving into area they really don't know anything about. Right. The, it's just a state area. Let the, let the state offices handle it. But kind of the trade-off right now is if you can't, if you weren't successful, this is the sanctuary area that we're also talking about taking. And the guys in the Keys are fighting it hard right now. But the northern Keys are really who's going to be the affected the worst, if or the most, if, if it does go through. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and you probably haven't heard anything of it uh -oh. prior to this. No, this is your breaking news to me uh, here. Bryce Barr is extremely well. He's in Key West and he keeps saying, dude, I'm fighting this, but the area we're are, we've already gone through. There are sanctuary areas down there that they're not allowed to play in at all. But fortunately Key West is so expansive. The fishing area is so expansive that yeah. they're able to fish elsewhere and successfully, but, but they're talking about taking some more and they're fighting that. And they said, but the worst of it is Key Largo area all the way up. It's relatively uninhabited there, Ocean Reef, to yeah. other than the Key Largo There's Sea. There's a Fowey kind of up and, up and down South that way. South Fowey. South Fowey. That's what I mean, like, right, yeah. Yeah, well, they call the Triumph area Beacon. Mm -hmm. It would be the farther northern boundary. But this is, I mean, a lot of fishermen use that area. Yeah. But fishermen are prone not to talk until it's too late and something happens. So what can we do? Uh, read up, get more involved. I'm two-thirds illiterate. I can't see up close anymore. These cheaters try to help me. But, again... ADD. I read for my biggest issue with the council deal too. It's there's so much reading. I read for ten minutes and my mind's off thinking about fishing somewhere. Yeah, for sure. I can't keep up. So I battle. mean, well, I guess you know part of part of what we can do is you know we're trying to raise awareness of the issues on the show. Yep, right? absolutely. Big part. Um, this is you know wonderful. And, and that that's one of the efforts that we're trying to make here. And hopefully people listen and hopefully people take into account some of the things that we bring up here. Um, because you know I. You know, part of the part of me bringing this stuff up too is is for my own selfish reasons too because I want to get educated. Yeah. And as much as I think I know about our estuarian systems and our coastal systems and our reef systems, um, you know, I you can't know enough. You know, and and I always try to bring on people like yourself that do know a lot more about it than I do, um, to shed some light on areas that maybe I haven't learned about, like the thing you're talking about right now. Yeah. Hey. Um, and I think it's important. Yeah, my, my lack of ability to convey the information, it, it, is, it has, I, I've battled that through the council process even. I, I get so angry because I, I know I'm not making myself clear that, you know, you, you, you need know that you legal are, mind. But, yeah, but that's okay, though, because I think, you know, some people, here's the thing. Maybe you are and you don't realize it because there's some people out there that just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and they might not be making a good point. But they feel cathartically that they're getting it out. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, I did a great job today. I talked a lot. Yeah. You know, maybe I'm quite the opposite. Well, but you might <laughs> your, like your short failed. words might be precise. So you know much I mean? going through your head and trying to get it all out. Exactly, yeah. it's yeah. a nightmare. I dude. get like that a lot too. Yeah, uh, and, and sit there at a council where you know you're affecting people's livelihoods. And and as important as I'm not a money guy, I could give a rat's ass about money. It's so yeah. fucking aggravating. But anyway, way. the. You know you're affecting people's livelihoods, but you know even more so you're affecting people's passions, their escape from their livelihood, which to me is the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Your ability to get away from all the difficult parts of life and go enjoy your time in the ocean, but you can't even put a hook in the water here. And and, yeah. and, and my f greatest fear is now being involved in this council process that I might be screw up and take some something away from somebody that unwarranted – and in, in my the last thing I want to do is is ever close a fishery, or you know through this process, which is part of the deal. If if a fish is being overfished and undergoing overfishing, terms I despise because it's so hard to actually determine that that's happening. The the process is to close a fishery. 
No, that is not the right move. Look where we are with American red snappers. Right. Species we don't deal much with down here, but there's a good portion of this region that <laughs> that, that is their favorite fish. That's, I mean, they're their biggest mm-hmm. target. And, and I say that if you put some time in on some deep wrecks and, in the area, you will catch American red snappers. And there's a couple of charter boat guys that are doing it right now. I wish they'd stop posting pictures of them. Yeah. I'm proud of them for catching them there to do it is a talent, but man, don't, don't bring the eyes of the world on a fishery that within state waters is legal. And the feds hate us for that. Uh-huh. Like blue tile fish. As long as you're not a federally licensed charter boat, you can catch blue line tiles year round in Florida because Florida knows that the species is doing fine, but the feds and their abstract and insane number or scientific method believes that the blue line tiles are about to go extinct. Yeah. Um, Not so, true. Hell no. No. Hell no. It takes a little bit of talent to catch them because you are fishing in deep water. Right. But it's just a harder fish to catch. Yeah. 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 And that kind of protects some of those deep water species. You know, it, some of them can take a beating and, and any of them, any species can be affected, but reasonable limits on fish when you're only hooking line fishing, they're going to do fine. They're going to survive. You're mm-hmm. not going to out. You're not going to crush the fishery. Now, giant nets and traps and different methods like that. Yes, you can put a dent in, the, in a species in a hurry, but hook one hook, one line, one rod, one reel. You're not. You're yeah, no you're one. Never of the, yeah, one of the, you never. One of the time, you're never going to out fish it yeah. with reasonable regulations. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, but they just raised the limit on the mutton leg too, right? They did, and that dude that was involved with that with, with yeah. FWC as so well. What, what's what's eighteen inches? And the reason for it, genius. Forever sixteen inches. We knew male mutton snappers became reproductively mature at sixteen inches. Mm-hmm. That's the number. Let them at least reproduce once, right? And in the amount of eggs, it's you know it's a large reproduction. Well, it turns out they did some more science and more studying, real science with real fish, and found out that wait a minute, females don't become re- reproductively mature until they're eighteen inches. Mm-hmm. That's got to be the number. Once they explained that, literally the entire room said, oh, genius. It's the right thing to do. The whole room voted for 18-inch minimum on mutton snappers. Let the females reproduce at least once. Dude, Mm -hmm. we're already seeing a benefit. That's what I was going to say. It's probably going to take about a year, and then you're going to see an uptick in muttons. Absolutely. And and, and, Well, the muttons were never overfished or undergoing overfishing. Their population has been extraordinarily strong. good, but it's But we're seeing bigger fish and a lot more of them. Very nice. So there also was – they wanted to reduce – from 10 fish to five fish on your aggregate bag limit on mutton snappers on a species that wasn't undergoing overfishing and was in no peril whatsoever, which I felt like the only thing, only people that we were punishing here at this point were talented mutton fishermen. Mm-hmm. And I, and, and I was not a fan of that one though. I'm a, I'm a conservationist by, by all means, especially in the recreational community. Cause I hate waste. I hate people killing 20 dolphin fling them, stick them in their freezer a year later, they're throwing them away. Yeah. That nothing pisses me off more than that. But so few people are capable of catching 10 muttons in a day for one guy and potentially a 30 mutton trip with three guys. Why are we punishing less than 1% of the fishing community? Cause that's mm-hmm. the reality of who's doing that. But I was unsuccessful in that argument and we are now at five fish, which it's a realistic way to look at it though. No doubt. But, and the only people I was really worried about were the people that were making the long trips, like the Tortugas and all that stuff. You, mm-hmm. yeah, I was worried that the, that charter fishery might get reduced and, and maybe the tourism of the private vessels that were trailering down there. But it, it doesn't seem to have. Guys are still doing it. So I was wrong. And maybe we're doing a better job with conservation on the species. I would, however, love to see a closed air closure of the known spawning aggregations on buttons. To me, it's cheating and... Because they're easy enough fish to catch at least a few of outside of that. And anytime guys are going in and doing it, they're murking big female mutton snappers. They're just cram full of eggs. And I was going to ask, is, is, is there something that you would regulate? Um, because I don't want um, people to get the idea that you're all like, no, don't touch anything. Don't, you know what I mean? Because you no, don't no. care about it all. You know what I mean? Is there something that you see that might be kind of well, tinkering? I'm fighting hard right now to reduce the... 60 fish cap on mahi's. I want it. I want it to 35, but it's. I think we're going to land at 40 fish on dolphin. It still will be 10 per angler, 40 fish, whichever's less. Mm-hmm. So two guys catches 20. And that way, when you have your two person charter, I don't want to catch 20 reasonably sized dolphin. I don't. I'm not much for killing the little ones. I, I, but if I pull up on a 
water fish and I see nothing but little ones, I go on. Hey, yeah. look at a pretty dolphin. Take some pictures swimming in the water. Don't put a hook in the water. No yeah. reason. These yeah. fish aren't 20 inches, aren't even close. Yeah. Maybe maybe they're 23 inches. If later in the day we haven't got any keepers, okay, we'll take a few. But I'm not killing 20 dolphin, and I'm, and I'm very cautious as to, to putting hooks in small fish that I don't even think are legal. Mm-hmm. They're cool to see swimming around the boat. Feed them a few live chummers, let them bust around. Sure. The, the charter generally is very excited and happy to see this. Why aren't we catching these? They're small. They're not legal. Let's not potentially kill them. Right. Sounds perfect. They have never once had a complaint there. Never. I don't think anyone's no. ever said that, oh, we can't catch them. They're too small. And be like, oh, come on. I want to catch them anyway. Yeah. I don't think anyone's really ever kind of. You know what's fun with that? We always bring our bay rods, and there's Amoco jacks all over every weed patch. And yeah. throw some jigs in. If there's kids especially, they play with that. Yeah. And you know what's amazing, too, is you'll be playing with those Amocos. Mm-hmm. And a horse will swim up, a big yeah. mahi, and they will yeah. eat those albacores. You get the albaco out of the water and get a goggle eye to them, and yeah. here we go. You know, a cool thing, too, is um, it's a pretty good way if you're learning how to fly fish. Yep. Oh, yeah. Is just to just start cast, throwing that fly into a school of little peanuts. Even more important to me, the, the fly fish thing is a whole other world, and I did a little bit as a kid. but No, so, it's, a, it's yeah. a different world, for sure. But you want to teach an angler how to be a good angler, how to, to, to truly— um, Oh, shit. I've lost my word here. But anyway, to be to learn how to be a good angler, give them a two or four pound setup. Mm-hmm. Go catch Jack Cravels or Almacos yeah. or, or whatever. Something that, that pulls pretty good or blue runners mm-hmm. that have those erratic. You can really learn how to read a fish while you're tight with them. And that's right. There's some some good fishermen out you there. You learn how to work a drag that way too. Like exactly. With, with a well, you know, non consequential way. If you're in a harness long enough, with a with a big fish, you create a relationship with the fish through the rod. You you can tell when the fish is about to ramp up and when you delay to him and allow him to do his thing. And you can tell when we're fishing eighteen pounds of drag, but he's kind of lazy right now. He's not burning too much energy. We'll, I'll ramp up. You go, you can learn how you can palm and and, mm-hmm. and really work a fish, work a fish. But you'll feel that energy if you're if you're good. Yeah, you can feel his energy ramping up through the line. Exactly how I don't know, but you can definitely if you're in one, learn that. And a, and a great way to learn to get to that place is to start with light line. Because, you you know, I don't care if you're fishing 18 pounds of drag. If he's fixing to ramp up and made it, make one of those explosive runs, you yeah. better back down a little bit. Yeah. You better feel it before it happens because if you don't, it's too late. Yeah. You pulled a hook, you broke a line. Yeah. And that will matter in a tournament setting. Oh, God, nothing matters. <laughs> it's I always mean, right, it's yeah. always one fish. Yeah. You, got, you get those guys that are just so like, I just need to get this fish in the boat. It's like, no, you just need to have some patience. Exactly. And take your exactly. time. Yeah, and that's been torture yeah. for us. We've been tight with more big yellow fin tunas and one blue fin tuna, which I was on the phone with the feds. Yeah. I can definitely kill this fish, right? <laughs> right. It was it was clearly 74 plus inches, but he was staying on top, had another one with him, and mm-hmm. fighting him on 20 pound for almost two and a half hours. And they were hand, the charter was handing the rod around, and we were close, man. We were so close so many times. And finally, the last guy, we'd done this long enough, and he's pumped. Yeah. Can't do that. No, bro. Yep. We put this much time in. Yeah. Fish was tired. We put had the heat them. on them. No. no, not with twenty pound. <laughs> but no, I mean, we had like the whole release. Yeah, we got a release on a bluefin. We had to float to the tip several times, but fifteen feet away and try. You yeah. don't. You don't try to gaff a two hundred eighty pound fish fifteen feet away. Get him a little closer. But yeah, you're asking for trouble. You don't. Yeah. I mean, when's the last time you actually really fish? Like oh, a, with the rod in my hand. Yeah, I got a video last year when. Well, when we go to the Bahamas on a family vacation, we always take a year in the islands. But, and even then, generally trying to keep my family with rods and hands. But I got a video from the tower last year catching a really nice dolphin. Uh-huh. And and I remember saying, I think— You're this fighting is, it from the tower? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Cast it to him. Said, yeah. Fuck it, I'm not handing the rod off. This is my guys were on the boat, though. Right. This wasn't a charter. And 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 caught a, a solid 30-pound mahi out of the tower. It was so funny. And running a boat, trying to chase him down there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the guys were videoing from down on the deck. Yeah. And, and, yeah, somewhere. It's, yeah, it was a good one. I enjoyed that. And I've, it's generally where I catch the few fish I get to catch anymore is from the tower. Or in the summer, uh-huh. I caught a really nice king in Jamie's first tournament there in May. Uh, I did, you know, primarily just pitching a spinning rod while, you know, helped get the spread up and then. Yeah. Watching that. Is that why you were so happy that day? Uh, I uh, saw you on the dock. Right? Hey, what's up? You uh, uh, drinking here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's the only time I drink anymore. I've gotten so old I can't handle it. Yeah, it's drink at the tournaments after after the party's over after the game. Yep, yep. When it's all said and done. So, what yep. tournaments you got coming up now? Uh, D- Ben's dust them off tournament there. Look so forward you are to getting guys the dust them off. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And then uh, really not until January. We, one of my favorite events of the year there in the the uh, 
Well, you guys are doing an operation in, oh, that, yep, in, that's, in December. Is no, it still January, December? No, they no, moved it to January, January, January now. Yeah. Right. Jamie's okay. done a good thing in trying to chase what uh, a changing fishery. It used to be that December in Palm Beach was mm-hmm. guaranteed to be strong, and, and it's more January, February now. It's, it's crazy. We get that October, November, which we really haven't had Things yet. It's been a little late recently, yep. right? Yeah, well, we'll get, we'll get a day in October, November, the first couple of fronts where the fish will get up top, and, mm-hmm. and you'll, you can do a 20, 25-fish day. It happens every year for two or three days in October, November, somewhere. Yeah. And then it kind of gets turned into the four or five fish. Or December. It happens with like the October swell sometimes too. Exactly. In the surf and it's yep. now become like a November swell. Kind of, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. But then uh, the uh, the pickle dish tournament, I got to, you put me on the spot. I can't even remember the name of one of my favorite tournaments. With the, with the Jupiter? No, it, the, the old one there. The, the silver sail fish. Silver, thank yep. you. Yep, we we've had quite a bit of success, success there, and and I love the history of the event. It's mm-hmm. the oldest running billfish tournament in the U.S. and, and been, had the good fortune of winning it, and had a second and a third. And Skipper beat me one time. The ah, <laughs> Skip ditches me, and I miss having that guy in the boat. Such a great personality and such an extraordinary fisherman. But yeah, he's he's where he should be. Yeah, yeah. he's where for he should sure. be running boats for sure. But I miss him. It's so fun having, but anyway, he he beat me. He won that that. Uh, it was us, the three hundred five guys. Also, who might be my closest rivalry is uh, Nick there down in Miami. From day one, he was running silent hunt. No, it wasn't silent hunt. It was the keys guys. One, he was running a boat down in Miami when I was running uh, my boat, my thirty two. When I was getting some free entries and get to play in the selfish stuff. And then uh, when I was running Robbie Buckley's boat there a little bit, it was it was unbelievable how often that guy would beat me by one fish or something. How long ago was this? Years back, so two thousand ten. This, this is when you had the boat with with like the no tower and no t top. Yeah, yeah well, the, that yeah, was my yeah, boat. Yeah. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I never had a t top on anything until I started charter fishing. Did we have a t top on the one we won the Mayor's Cup in? Oh wait, no, uh, uh-uh. that was a topless uh, boat. Yeah. Yeah. I also remember seeing you guys out on the water, always wearing the big straw hats <laughs> and everything. Yeah, you know, the team top. On. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that awesome. was my guys. I just went out and got sunburned. So we got tournament season coming up. Yep. All right. We got connected by water tournament report. Recap, re- the, the, the monthly, whatever we decide to name this thing, yep. uh, featuring Captain Art Sap coming up. So you're going to see more of you. Yep. We're going to see more of you on this show, which we're yep. so excited about. <laughs> um, and um, a lot of good things coming. We're yep. going to probably, during that tournament report, have some updates on this Atlantic Fisheries Council stuff. If, like there's, any, if yeah. there's any news, we can bring up some any any latest yeah. happening. So I'll start bringing my notes, too, because during the course of the thing. Yeah, because I'd notes. like to make this also kind of like um, a source or place where people can come for updates on, on stuff like that, too, um, which I think would be, you know, beneficial to everybody yep. just to rather than expecting people to read. Was yep. William Randolph Hearst, you know, the great newspaper guy said one thing i've learned in all my time here in the newspaper business is people don't like to read (laughs) it's hard man everyone likes pictures yeah um so we're gonna probably bring that to people in broadcast format yep if i may real quick while we were talking earlier we're talking about recreational reporting there's oh right yeah the first step in that game is a is a an app called my fish counts or in there you can follow them on instagram and facebook and all that stuff well it's it's a it's a very easy place. To my re- fish counts. My fish counts. Yep. Okay. Run by the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, but going to be taken over by another entity of some kind. I don't know for sure how or who, but you actually make your reports. You tell them exactly what you saw, what you caught. No different than what you're doing on social media already. But this right. actually helps. This counts. This matters. And 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 I'm a huge proponent of that, and and hopeful that we can get some people start using the thing. Okay. And so my fish this, counts. Yeah, this will be actual factual science. What's actually being taken out of the ocean? So this is something people can do, right? This, this is, is yes, what we're asking people. What can people do? Yeah. All right. So this is a big thing. It's not the presumptive science. Yeah, that and we can post using. about this. I want to post it like when we post up this show, we'll post up this show. But I want to yeah. do a separate post about this because I think this is important. Yeah, yeah. Break out the phone. Yeah, yeah, the phone. Because I want to do a separate post about this and because this is actually really important. I'm glad you're bringing this up again. It's my bad. I forgot to bring that up again. All right. Where are you? My fish counts. There it is. See it. I don't know where all the cameras are. If it yeah, well, I'll pull. I'll pull it up. Yeah, I'll do a screen grab and stuff. bring it up. Wonderful, wonderful. So it's it's just this. My fish counts and okay. you see start a new trip and you can see some of my history yep. on here. Uh, profile trips. There you go. Your history. See, so you haven't you haven't crashed this app yet. 
Well, no. I see. So, <laughs> all right. So, it's, none been, of you guys are going to crash it. Never no, hasn't crashed it. No, no. I've only been using it about a year now, and and I admittedly got frustrated, not with the with the app, but with the process at one point. Yep. And and quit for about two months or so, and then I have delved dove back in, and it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing that is going to save us from for a vulgar and lack of better term bullshit science that has been controlling recreational and even to some degree commercial fishing forever. This is really great. Yeah. And the thing is, is commercial fishermen are held to such a stringent uh, laws or the, every fish they catch shows up in their reports has to. Right. And so we, it's real science that is governing commercial fishing right now. And yet their counterpart in recreational fishing there's there's no real numbers. There's no real science. So that obviously creates some animosity. That animosity's got to go away because those same environmentals we were talking about. Mm-hmm. That's the fight. Right. The yeah, the, they want know, things to the extreme. Yes, commercial yeah. fishermen and recreational fishermen. If we can't find a way to get together and, and get along, right, we're gonna lose everything to the the enviros. They're, yeah, they've got more money and more clout in government than than we do. Truth yeah. be told, and. Because some of their desires are so extreme and so ridiculous that they're not able to push them through just yet, but give them too much time with that, with while we continue to bicker over here on the sides between us, mm-hmm. and we we will lose. Well, that's what I, what we were saying. We were talking about before the shows. I really don't talk politics on the show unless yeah. it has something to do with you know clean water and our community. Because yeah. there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do things, mm-hmm. right? And um, I I truly believe that. Um, the outdoorsmen and the conservationists and us all are doing it the right way because we are the, the ones, majority, the majority, the majority, the vast you're right. majority, you're the vast majority because, because we're the ones that are out there, you know, living in it and dealing more than with making it and a living. It. Yeah. Uh, more than making a living, living it, not, you know, making a living, surviving, making the money part, uh, you got to do it just to survive. But the, the, the release, the escape is in the ocean for us. And I think that is far more important. The passion far more important than even paying your mortgage, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, you might, I agree with you, you might not see this as much as I do, or at least this this kind of contrasting effect, because you're out on the water a hell of a lot more than I am. 300 days a year. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, because I'm out a little about, I'm a little close to the Everglades here, and you know, I'm <laughs> running a full-time studio, and yeah. you know what I mean? And, and it's creating like, some it, unbelievable it, artwork. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm working about pulling about 60 hours a week in this place. So I don't get out to the water as much yeah. as, you know, we're going to try to change that in the in the coming year because we're at a spot in, in the studio now where it's like, okay, Dennis needs to get out of the water more than he has in the past couple of years because building this was important. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I do get out there, you get reminded of things. Uh, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, and I always bring that back to the studio with me and I create a better clearly. painting with it, you know, and, it, and it's very inspiring to me from that way. It's like, oh, yeah almost forgot about the way that felt or that felt or no. smelt or felt or looked or feel, you know, whatever. I so wish I had that ability, yeah. dude. I don't know how you guys do it. But, but my point, my point is this, like if you're an environmentalist, quote unquote, right. But you never are out there. Right. And all you're doing is walking that, down the street with a poster in your, in your hand and you're yeah. whining and complaining about something. It's like, well, maybe you don't know you really don't. what the deal is. Not, it's not a maybe Dennis. Yeah. They that's, don't that's, know. What I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm just yeah. being nice. I know I'm not, you know, maybe they don't know. You don't know. <laughs> what these guys are dealing with, we know uh, on, on the th- guys are out there 300 days a year on the water. That's the most aggravating you know, thing about this council. The scientists yeah. keep telling us, we don't know. That's not a dusky shark. That's not a sandbar shark. Yeah. Uh, guys, when was the last time you physically saw a dusky shark or a yeah. sandbar shark? Get out of your office and come look at them with us. Look at my videos. Yeah. That's a that's a one time event. It's every time event, every guys. Time. They don't believe you for yeah. a second. I'm the no, one reeling up my goggle eye so it doesn't get hit by a hammerhead. You know, and then yeah. dropping it down like way too often now. Yeah, or watching the yeah. watching the sandbar shark smoke eighty yeah. percent yeah. of the fish you hook. Right. I'm the surprising. one bringing up yeah. fish heads. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. even that, I mean, yeah. they get the whole freaking thing. And, yeah. and chartered anglers are not always the best. Makes it that much harder for them. They'll see a nice mahi eat a kite bait, or they'll see a big king or a black fin tuna. That might be the only time they get to see them because mm-hmm. sharks don't eat them awfully frequently. Yeah. Yeah. And it's everywhere, dude. It's Key West to North Carolina, and, and the science guys just don't know. Not happening. Yeah. It's not happening. Dude, we video it. We prove it. Take them t- fishing. They won't get on a boat. They, no, we got, we're too busy in our office. <laughs> they get seasick. <laughs> no, at one point in their life, they 
did have the intention and did have or had good intentions. But now they're so stuck in their office and so stuck with their numbers and their beliefs that they're right and nobody else is. Yeah. Guys, experience counts more for education. If you physically see it, it happened. Well, let's name some organizations that they can go, well, people can pay attention to. The IGFA is a good one. Billfish yep. Foundation is a good one. The CCA Absolutely. is a good one. Yeah. Um, you know, what right. other organizations or things that people can pay attention to that, that could probably be on, on the Keep right America side? Keep America Fishing. Keep America Fishing. And most of everything we're talking about is the recreational side of it. There's There are several commercial organizations. Um, what the heck? There's so many acronyms in my head now from all this game that I've been playing mm -hmm. over the last year, and I'm just not smart enough to keep up with them all. But there's a you know, there are several commercial organizations that that uh, we'll flash some up here on the yeah. screen here. I've got that, that's fine. Well, John will flash yep. them up on the screen. He'll you, you'll yep. remember them later. We'll put them up right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. And, and being involved in any of that, and then someone uh, are everybody's to some degree ad agenda driven. Mm -hmm. uh, all these organizations are to some degree good, bad, and different. But, you know, if you if you study up on all of it as much as you can, as much as your brain will allow you to before the ADD fully kicks in or, or life kicks in with the kids mm -hmm. and everything else. But just being involved, dude, get involved and, and talk and try to learn and open minded. Please don't be a brick and not be willing to listen at all and potentially learn something. So so many people develop an opinion and won't sway. I'm not yeah. smart enough to have an opinion that's that solid. Yeah. You know. Talk to me with something that makes sense and show me some proof and and I'll listen and, and hopefully maybe work with you towards it. And I'd like to see more willingness. We're in such polarizing times right now that yeah, for sure. once an opinion is developed, it's so hard to to sway anybody. Well, the more involved you are, the more solid your opinion can be, I yeah. think. Yeah, and that's another reason why we don't really get too, so involved in politics because, yep. you know, it's like people get so entrenched in that. Yeah. You know, we're now we're now like I said this, this is out there now I'm fighting a battle. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I gotta no. stick to my guns and I can't lose. And yeah, that's that, no. that's horrible. Yeah, that's not my place either. Um Captains for Clean Water is probably another good organization. Uh, without a know. doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. Um, and, and not a group that I'm terribly familiar with because it's so much West Coast and shallow water stuff that yeah. but yeah, they're I, I more love what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. More inshore for sure. Yeah. So, I just want to see a day where I don't see plastic littering the ocean everywhere and freaking mylar balloons everywhere and yeah, no plastic, no balloons. We want to see that Everglades flowing. Um, that's going to benefit everybody. We want to Absolutely. see some deer come back into the Everglades, and we want to see more panthers, and we want to see Dude, you know, more birds. And you know, well, obviously, we just want to see more. Yeah. You know, to bring the noise, you know, we just yeah. want to, we just want to see that area thrive. Yeah, oh, without a doubt. You know what I mean? I, I say what we want to see is panthers more spread through the area. I yeah. guess because where they are, they're in extreme abundance. Right. Right. Well, they're 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 getting kind of cornered, but yeah. you know, a little yeah. bit, but. Um, so this week is the boat show, the Fort Lauderdale boat, boat show. show. So we're in boat show season now, officially. Absolutely. Absolutely. Start to set, you know, the best thing about this is start to sailfish season. That's right. Shortly after boat show. Yep. But, uh, yeah, we've been, uh, I say we, I work. So Jim Steele, very important part of my fishing crew in the tournaments and everything. He mm -hmm. helps to finance it and he's an extraordinarily good angler. He's my right short guy on the, on the sailfish tournaments and he fishes the flat side and the meat fish stuff. But, love uh, Jim. yeah, I love the guy. He's, Quickest wit, I think I know. Mm -hmm. I don't even try yeah, to. Yeah, Jim's one of the coolest, yeah, man. Yeah, it's amazing. But anyway, he needs some help during the Lauderdale Boat Show pushing those yachts in. And and I've had the good or bad, for, I don't know, of being with him doing it since the very beginning now. I think six years we've been doing it together since he first got hired on to do it. Mm -hmm. Another company had it before him and was not very successful from what I understand with it. And, and understandably so, because it is not easy, dude. It's stressful. I wouldn't want to do it. Dude, the current and the yeah, wind. I mean. We, we totally block the intracoastal waterway. Stop the water up like a dam from time to time with <laughs> these giant yachts. It's amazing. The amount, literally, when you get it pushed in, the water just surges and blows by. Yeah, never seen anything like it. Yeah. So the first year we're doing it, none of us had ever done it, period. No, none of the tug. He's got the best equipment in the industry by mm -hmm. far. But none of the tug captains had ever done it. And... You're communicating with guys that don't necessarily speak English even, trying to get 150, 200 foot, 250 foot, or even a couple of 300 foot. Yeah, because you're getting boats from international boats from all over all the place. All over the world. Yeah, yeah, they all come to Lauderdale. Trying to get those them in between these giant steel I-beams that are plugged into the ground that might not be more than two feet wider than the boat. Literally, mm -hmm. you got a foot on each side of these things. Trying to get them in these, in, in even some of them trying to do it without assistance at all. Like, you'd be 
getting you know push boats trying to push these yachts in and everything yeah. goes finally you look over and there's a guy crashing into i beams everywhere oh. 100 yards from you they dude wait please right I mean, we got boats to help and you know maybe we're not the greatest in the world at it yet but at least we're not crashing you right see so, yeah, everybody we steam over there and, and i got hung up in one where i'm trying to save a guy in a 190 plus foot giant speaking french don't have the slightest idea what this guy's saying to me at all but i can see he's crashing and it's bad and Oh, this no. is my second day ever running a tugboat. Mm -hmm. And I loop in there and I get to push it and I'm going to save this guy. And oh shit, I can't stop him. Current got him. And here comes the dock line and Jim's just screaming, dude, don't worry about the boat. Get out of there. You're yeah. going to die. You're, yeah. dude, there's no doubt you're going to die. And somehow he gets wedged on another boat. And finally the guy starts to try to speak a little bit. And he's saying, he's yelling, do your job. Do your, the yacht captain is. Well, Cap. To you? Yeah. After Cap, you might should have asked us to help you do your job. Uh, has he hired you yet? No, no. This is we're helping the boat show. There's no hire at all. Yeah. So you might should have done. You know, let us know that you needed help doing your job prior right. to you just crashing into everything, and then we come try to save you. So this that starts the learning prog process through the whole deal, and then to this year, we had one boat try to go in by itself. Most everybody waits for us now, and there's one little six inch mark on one yacht over there. To the entire building, but yeah. like, uh, uh, the the transition and wow. the, the education that we got and the the yacht captains got and the confidence that they developed in what I believe to be the best yacht towing company that has ever existed anywhere in the world. I mean, yeah, no to doubt. listen to these yacht captains talk, dude, they're God bless steel towing. You hear it a thousand times over mm -hmm. through the course of the show. It's amazing the reputation that they've developed loading these multi million dollar monsters. And, but it's a year-round thing. The guy's towing them up and down the river. I've done a few of those jobs with them. Yeah. Dude, the stress level those guys live under, those guys, those tug captains, ah. Uh, well, that's the thing. But they it's, don't crash. That's the thing. It's like I see what Jim does, and I'm, I'm in awe of that. Because uh, I'm like, well, first of all, how do you even, where do you begin? Yeah. Right? Where do you learn that? Yeah. And and then second of all, like, the liability, the, the what oh. you're responsible for. Like, those boats are not cheap. No. If, and and if your huge. lines are on them, they're your. It's your yeah. responsibility. If your lines are tied to those boats, your I responsibility. I wouldn't want to do it. No, it's fun though. It's exciting as hell. It, again, it's you get that little bit of a rush, that adrenaline yeah. rush. But uh, but that brings us in. It's the Lauderdale Boat Show time, dude. The, the industry is screaming right now. Yeah. Motor yeah. company manufacturers can't build motors fast enough. Mercury is, in my opinion, the greatest motor manufacturer that's ever existed. It's got a 450, which I get to run a 39 CV with trip 450 Mercury Verados on it. At wow. the show for sea trials, I'm so excited. Wow. I hope to be a, my next boat I build to be a triple boat with power like that and my big tower. Because mm -hmm. the, the, that much cleaner water to the props, trip over quad. Right. The boat rides better. It performs better. I'm, I'm so excited with the, the motor manufacturers creating this, this kind of power now that didn't exist in the past. It, it's, it's really kind of mind-boggling mind -boggling. what's going through the industry right now. Like yeah. even like... Like how the the fact that like a boat of your size is now becoming more and more common <laughs> over the years, which was never really like when you did oh. like a thirty nine CV, it's like what? That's this a huge giant. center console, and you, now you got Joey running around and Skip driving yeah. the big fifty three swingos, and like and they built a sixty five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and boat is the only one. Call that an Estrella or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's I mean, but it's a good looking boat too. That sixty five. Good looking boat. Good yeah. looking boat. But it's you know it's crazy how the industry is blown up and it's going to be on full display at the boat show because i mean that's what was like the world's largest or most diverse boat show or something uh, like most, what, what's the, the largest title in water boat show in, in the water. world okay and in the, in the convention center in that air conditioning which is hottest october i've ever seen yeah but they've got more center consoles and more of the the stuff that i love to see in that convention center mm -hmm. outboard motors and, and center consoles and, and the majority of the tackle and that sort of stuff are over in the tents also air conditioned over the EMR area mm -hmm. giant but the, the the amount of yachts that are on display I don't think there's anywhere in the world the Mediterranean can kiss my grits they got shit on yeah. Lauderdale right no, now no not at all I love yeah. seeing it by water too it's amazing You're just trying to yeah. driving through there you know we usually do that every year we just just like do yourself a favor Sunday afternoon because it closes on Sundays now no longer go to Mondays Sunday afternoon around five o'clock. Really Stay out of the way. No, no, get in there. Get in there and listen to it. All the horns. The horns. They blow yep. the horns off. It's mm -hmm. deafening. The water shimmies from the the air getting released. It's awesome, dude. Yeah. I, I video it every year. I go live and do the because I'm in there helping them get getting ready to get those tugs out of there. And yeah. it's a mad. I mean, get those yachts out. It's a mad rush too. 
Yeah, no, we got to check that out. I mean, we'll, we'll we'll record this on a Tuesday, but we're going to be airing it on Thursday. So when people see this, it's going to be the Thursday of the show. Yep, second day of the show. Yep, second day of the show. So I'm hoping to get in there on Wednesday, which would be technically yesterday if you're listening to the <laughs> yeah. show now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a great day, too, because it's quiet. Yeah, I like that's what I'm saying. If I day. can just, you know, I can go run around and, you know, shake all the hands and see all the people I need to see and stuff like that. But um, So you're going to be doing a lot of that, though. We're doing a lot of sea trials, and, and much of Wednesday I'll spend at the show there in the convention center. I, I don't really have time to get over to BHMR because we do get a few sea trials there Wednesday, but but uh, they, I'll be there all five days mm-hmm. yeah, doing, the, doing the boat show thing. Yeah, no, that's exciting. I mean, it's um, I don't think people understand really what that does for our economy every year. Um, oh, it's huge. Yeah, it, it's really huge. Um, it is one of the world's largest scenes um, every year, and we're yeah. fortunate to have it. Um, it is one of the things that puts us on the map in the boating and yachting community, whether it's the Fort Lauderdale Tats itself, as we say, the yachting, yachting capital, capital of the world, or that's their, yeah. their self-proclaimed title. Um, yeah. But it is such a phenomenon um, yeah. of a circumstance, um, and it's beautiful to see. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> and the wealth being on display like that is extraordinary. Uh, I, it's unbelievable. You can't even believe that there's that much money in the world to have that many mega yachts floating in, in the amount of dude, the amount of people that are working on these things. There's 30 and 40 yeah. people on every one of these yachts right. getting paid pretty handsomely. They're buildings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're buildings on water. They're, they're you know, yeah, for sure. And the they hotels. They all shine like a ruby. They're all gorgeous. The amount of effort that they put into these things. Yep. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. It's hard to keep my boat waxed. Yeah. It's 40 feet long. These things are 200 feet long. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, it's insane to think about the, the, you know, and, you know, people want to complain about it at all. You know, it's like, well, you know how much, how many people are being employed Empl- there? And, you know, you know, it's an economy driver. Oh, without a doubt. And, and frequently these are kids getting life experiences that the majority of us don't get to travel much. You know, it's, right. it's expensive to travel far and in the way right. that wealthy people travel. Well, work on somebody's boat and you're traveling, getting life experiences that there's no other way to get for the majority of the population. So it, it it's more than just a, a financial gain for these kids. And, and I say kids, I mean, you see people our age working on these boats. Mm-hmm. They spend lives working on them. Uh, I see nothing but a positive out of it. Environmentally damaging, well, there's a trade-off. you got to live, too. Yeah, there's a trade-off. But, I mean, no. listen, we're, we're set up for it. Yeah, you oh, know, we are. That, that's Absolutely. what, you know, the whole Port Everglades and that, that whole area and the, that yeah. how wide the intercoastal is up there. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect built for it. Yep. So there, there, there's no worries there, I think. Other than the current. Oh, my God, the current. Yeah. It's tough, dude. I, the inbound, especially up in the Los Olas area, the inbound t- current's not – it's the same speed, but it, it works north-south where the outbound, it gets up in that basin. Mm-hmm. And generally, you don't put the giants up there, but you put some 100-plus footers up there, and they catch so much water, and it's coming towards the west. And nobody believes you when you say, hey, you're going to get set to the west. Well, it's outbound tide. How am I going to get set to the south? Yeah. You know, there's a yeah. basin. It Trust me. And then, wham. It's gonna try to it's gonna eddy up, yep. yeah, for sure. Yep. Uh, it's an interesting time of year because you got, you know, it really, to me, it's a signifier of everything changes. Yep. Right, because right around October, you could start sensing like you know the weather shifting. End of hurricane and, season. Yeah, yeah, the end of hurricane <laughs> season, the weather shifts, yep. and then we got Halloween and the holiday season starts, and then boat show, and it's like really the launch of our sailfish our peak season, and then that's <laughs> what I was gonna get into, and then you get in the sailfish, and then um. That's really all that matters. And everything really does change, so which you truly are addicted to. Oh, yeah. So, so totally addicted to sailfish. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, exciting time for the boat show. Exciting time for South Florida. Tournament season kicking up. Holiday season kicking up. Um, you can have those things. That's all right. That's all right. You know, <laughs> listen, I get into it. You know, it's yeah. fun. Oh, it's okay. fun. I got a, I've got a daughter, nine-year-old daughter. She yeah. loves it. It's such a pain in the ass. It's a pain. <laughs> It's a pain. Yeah, it's, you know, I used to look forward to Christmas and, you know, all this stuff. Now it's like I got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, and it's just work. Yeah, I think the last time I looked forward to it, I was six. It's a pain. Yeah. But whatever. I love Thanksgiving. I do, too. I love food. Yeah. Family gets together, hang out. Yeah. Yeah. That's selfish. I don't have to buy anybody anything other than maybe we go on a trip or something. But Yeah, hang out, love watch it. some football. Yeah. You know, even take it easy, you know, for love sure. It. Well, I want to thank you for coming on today. My pleasure. Right. And um, we're going to have you on a lot more. And with our tournament report coming up, we don't know what we're going to call it yet. Yep. Uh, we're going to call it something. We're going to have put some your artistic people brain to it. Put, put my artistic brain to it. We'll design a logo. We'll, we'll, we'll give it a name. We'll give it a mark. And we'll, we'll make it look beautiful. So I love it. Um, Captain Arsap, I want to thank you for coming on today. 
My pleasure, my friend. Right? Your ego is not your amigo. Do your best and let God do the rest. Always remember to eat, drink, and be local. And always remember that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we are always connected by water. Love this community. Love it. Love it.